Welcome back, scientist buddies. I hope you're having a great day so far and we're able to get outside and enjoy the nice weather we had. To remind you, my name is Leslie and I'm a scientist at the University of Minnesota. Remember that you can submit any questions you have for me and I'll be sure to answer them. All right, let's get into our pollinator topic for the week. First, I want to tell you about a really good habitat or place to live for lots of pollinators. The stretch of land that runs alongside roads, sometimes called a ditch, is actually a really good habitat for pollinators. Some of the many ways in which roadsides support pollinators is by providing a lot of different types of flowers for bees, butterflies, and other pollinators to feed off of. These areas also tend to have just the right amount of bare soil for nests and provide shelter from predators. Finally, because roads are usually long and there isn't much else taking up the space right next to the road, these long stretches of flowers and shelter provide what is called a corridor, or an open pathway, for pollinators to travel on, moving from one place to another and spreading pollen as they go. This is especially important for pollinators that migrate, like monarch butterflies. But, roadsides only provide good habitats for pollinators when they are managed appropriately. Things like mowing too often, spraying pesticides, or over-applying road salt can disrupt the vegetation and make it harder for animals and insects to live there. The use of road salt in Minnesota is a prominent issue and will be the focus of our upcoming experiment. In the area of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, approximately 300,000 tons of road salt are applied to roads each winter, which is the same weight as 60,000 elephants. Road salt, also known as sodium chloride, is used to help melt the ice on roads so that they are less slippery and reduce the number of car accidents in the winter. The trade-off is that when the snow and salt melt, the salt washes away into the environment. A lot of scientists have been studying how increased road salt affects our waterways, but not as much attention has been brought to how it impacts terrestrial ecosystems, or places where plants and animals live on land. Road salt application can increase the availability of dietary sodium, or salt, for animals. This happens because as plants drink up water from their roots, salt comes with it, making the plants themselves saltier. When something like a caterpillar eats that plant, they are getting more sodium in their diet than they normally would. Some scientists actually go out to roadsides where salt has been applied, measure the amount of sodium in the plants, and catch butterflies to study their behavior, but this is a lot of work and can be hard to control. Instead, we can study the same idea by manipulating, or changing, the amount of salt in a caterpillar's diet in the lab and measure their growth over time. This is called an experiment because we change one variable, or thing, at a time. As we've mentioned before, scientists try to solve problems that are occurring in the real world, and many of these are related to human impacts on our environment. Last week, we also talked about how scientists use models to study how things work, but models aren't always the best way to answer a question, especially if you want to know how one thing reacts to another. If a scientist wants to determine how changing one variable affects another, they would conduct an experiment. Next week, you will be conducting a virtual experiment with scientist Regina. I want to give you a little bit of, bit of background information that is important for you to know for your experiment. First, let's talk about a butterfly's life cycle. Here, you see a picture of the life cycle of a painted lady butterfly. The butterfly starts out as an egg, which hatches to turn into a caterpillar. Then, the caterpillar forms a tough structure called a chrysalis, where it stays while it turns into a butterfly. Then, the butterfly breaks out of the chrysalis and is able to pollinate plants and lay eggs to start the life cycle all over again. In this experiment, we will be changing the amount of sodium, or salt, the caterpillars get in their diets by splitting the group of caterpillars in half and adding salt onto one group's food and not adding it to the other group's food. All of the other variables, like what temperature it is and how much sunlight they get, will remain controlled, or the same. We will let the caterpillars eat and grow for a couple of weeks, then when they start to form their chrysalis, we will mark how many days it took for them to get there and how much they weigh. Next, I want you to make an educated guess, or a hypothesis. What do you think will happen? Will the caterpillars with salt form their chrysalis sooner or later than the ones with a normal diet? Which group will weigh more? Use what you know about pollinators to make your hypothesis. Make sure you complete the first two sections of your lab notebooks before next week to prepare for the experiment. 
These sections are the background and hypothesis sections, both of which we talked about today. Okay, scientist buddies, that's all I have for this week. Next week, you'll be doing an experiment with scientist Regina, but I'll be back the week after that for our next unit. Good luck with the experiment. I'm so excited to see how it turns out. Okay, see you next time. Bye.